If you ever stumbled upon a newsstand or library sometime in the 90s or 2000s, then you might be familiar with Nickelodeon Magazine. Filled with puzzles, comics, and celebrities, it was perfect for those too cool for Highlights Magazine, but not yet old enough to understand the intelligent commentary of Mad Magazine. I tried to get my hands on this whenever I could, begging my parents to buy me special issues at the grocery store and sneaking into my friend's room to read his issues when he went outside. If you're watching this, Josh from first grade, I am so sorry. Recently, I was feeling a bit nostalgic, so I dropped probably too much money on a lot of 20 Nick mags, ranging from 2002 to 2009. I was subscribed for the last few years, but threw away each issue after I read them, not knowing better at the time. It's one of the many regrets from my childhood, that and compromising my friend's privacy. Sorry again, Josh. I can't wait to break into these magazines and soak in all that classic Nickelodeon goodness and wait a minute. There's only a few pages of content in each issue that's actually related to the channel. Everything else is <gasps> original and entertaining content. How am I supposed to forcefully appeal to my nostalgia now? Nick, 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 the Nick, 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 Nick Tando. One thing you'll quickly realize with Nick Mag is that there's a ton of content that doesn't quite seem like it should all be together in only one place. And I tend to have the same issue with my channel. I have loads of ideas, but not all of them end up in my videos for one reason or another. But recently, Amino reached out to me to create stories, bite-sized reviews and countdowns that you can only find on their app. Seeing that summer is pretty much here, I'm kicking things off with a look at my top five summertime cartoon episodes. To check it out, click the link in the description or the pinned comment to download the Amino app and search Nintendo Reviews to find my account. Follow me, watch my stories, and hit that bell icon to be notified whenever I upload something new. Doing all that helps this channel out a lot, so watch my story unfold on Amino today. When you pop open a crisp, decades-old Nickelodeon magazine, you'll see three things that you should know. The first is the distinction between real and fake articles. Nick Mag was known for its pranks, presented through fake advertisements, parody stories, and fake labels and covers that you could cut out and leave around your house to trick your parents. There was a lot of cool art on display, with both detailed hand-drawn pieces and slightly disturbing Photoshop work. One that I remembered featured gimmicky CGI movies that were a bit too accurate, like Calf Pipe over here is the Rocket Power and Home on the Range crossover I never knew I needed. I think my favorite insert was a fake Harry Potter book sleeve that mimicked the original American cover art. They called it Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Secret Goblet of the Half-Blood Phoenix at the cookout of Azkaban. I wonder what unnecessary and disgusting retcons could have been found here. A close second favorite would be the lukewarm Valentines in one Valentine's Day issue. I like you more than I like school, but less than Orlando Bloom. That insult is sure to slightly confuse someone for a brief moment as they try to remember who Orlando Bloom is. Some of the parody articles were quite fun, though the ones done in the style of specific reality TV shows felt very one note. Like one is just the Osbournes, but everyone is gross. It's not good. Sometimes the Nicktoons got in on the fun, where we got to see what the characters would look like all grown up and see Butch Hartman draw them in the Fairly Odd Parents style. Hey, he just ripped these concepts off for his YouTube channel. That's kind of a joke, I think. However, one gag feature was the most infamous thing in the magazine's history, Toon Weekly, this fake tabloid that gossiped about the lives of cartoon characters beyond the TV screen. It's an innocent enough idea, but the thing that weirds me out is that all of the characters look exactly like their copyrighted counterparts. When something like Mad does a parody like this, they always tweak the characters to make them not look like a lawsuit waiting to happen, but not here. You wanna get sued? This might as well be official art of Lisa Simpson dating Naruto, and that's a pretty good reason to question what humanity has come to, if you ask me. The second thing the magazine introduces to you in every issue is Zelda Van Gutters. This Land Lake Terrier would appear throughout every issue to deliver snarky comments and jokes. The story behind this character is that she was hired as the office manager due to budget cuts, and she would end up being Nick Mag's unofficial mascot. Even though her appearances were made up of only a few stock images, Zelda added a lot of charm to the magazine. Her name is even a pun itself, as she usually showed up in the magazine's margins, which are sometimes referred to as its gutters. I love this character, but it made me very sad that I couldn't actually pet her. Also, since the photos of her were taken 20 years ago, this dog is probably dead now. The 
final thing to know is that each issue has its own distinct theme. Most of the features and comics revolved around these topics, and they usually had no correlation with the brief cover stories. They recycled some of these every few years, but despite this, no two issues ever felt the same, and the content was always entirely unique. Even the page numbers and magazine credits were completely different every month. One odd example is the Say What feature in the April 2008 cartoon issue. Say what? Say what? Now with Say What, readers could fill in a speech bubble or a thought bubble with something funny and then send it to Nick Mag for it to be printed in a later issue. Say what? Say what? But here, instead of using a fake or stock image, they used the poster for Castle in the Sky. Say... Say... What? What? Two Halloween issues I had took different approaches to the same holiday by being either gross or spooky specials. One explained the history of toilets and cities across the country with ridiculous names, and the other had a genuinely unnerving short story and a recipe for making cookies that resemble monster feet, though it looks like this kid may just eat me first. Some issues were even fairly ambitious for their time. Throughout the latter half of their run, Nick Mag had a few issues with 3D sections. For whatever reason, two issues that heavily promoted Ice Age 2 and 3 both had this gimmick, which was either an odd bit of advertising or a brilliant coincidence. They each included a pair of old-fashioned red and blue glasses, which are feeling more and more nostalgic as 3D technology becomes more and more advanced. Some of the text-heavy advertisements did not look great in another dimension, but the comics made good use of this gimmick by simplifying their color schemes and even having a few strips that change depending on what eye of the glasses you were looking through. Speaking of which, my favorite part of Nickelodeon magazine was and still is the comic book. It's like a sampling of your library's entire graphic novel section in just a dozen pages or so. Over a dozen different creators contributed to just this one section of the magazine. The most famous original comic was Grandpa and Julie Shark Hunters, which centered around a girl and her bumbling grandfather searching for Steven, the largest shark in the world, who's ironically treated more like a friend than prey. I didn't know this until making this video, but in 2006, it was adapted into a pilot by Klasky Chupo that never got picked up. It probably didn't appeal to anyone who wasn't already a fan of Shark Hunters, but casting Hinden Walsh as Julie was a great fit. Why are we just sitting here? Even Buccaneer Becky would save her grandpa. I say we pull ourselves together and go get mine. Are you with me, Steven? Hello? Yellow? Yellow? My favorite comic was Seen But Not Heard, which is one of the only things that survived during the entirety of Nick Mag's run. It was the wordless and zany adventures of a bear and a pink man, and I recommend you check it out if you want to see how ridiculous a comic can get within just one page. The comic book also featured plenty of comics that adapted the newest and most popular Nicktoons of the time. Of course, Fairly Odd Parents and SpongeBob were represented, but so was Cat Scratch, Mr. Meaty, and The X's. Sometimes the original tone and style of the cartoons was maintained, but other times, not so much. I think one of the Jimmy Neutron comics actually gave me nightmares. Not for looking like this, but for including all these other Nicktoons characters in this really twisted and dark art style. I'm pretty sure that this was my first exposure to some of these characters, and boy was it not a good one at all. The magazine always seemed dead set on entertaining children through whatever it covered, and that included topical entertainment. One feature they handled quite well was the celeb page, where Nick Mag asked a random assortment of famous folk to answer simple questions that usually fell under the issue's aforementioned theme. This actually had some unique insight into the past and present lives of these people that most kids looked up to. They asked Brendan Fraser if he knew anyone who's like a cartoon character, and his response was, me. The same goes for whenever a movie was covered. It's really cool to learn about the process of creating a Wallace and Gromit feature straight from the director's mouth, or the process of training animals for a Harry Potter film. The interview they did with Hayden Christensen for Star Wars Episode 3 is also thrilling stuff. Did you keep any souvenirs from the set? I got myself a lightsaber. Where do you keep it? In my closet. With this being a Nickelodeon magazine and all, you would think that there would be tons of cross-promotion with the network itself. I don't personally remember seeing much for it, but I did find a couple of commercials from throughout the magazine's history, many of which kept the charm of the publication. Nick Magazine got that. Puzzles, comics, quizzes, sports, jokes, and pull out pranks to fool your phone. You can play, say what, make a voice for a scene, and maybe get your mind in the magazine. Nick Magazine got that. Now the strangest thing I dug up advertised a Nick at Night magazine 
Apparently, this was a one-shot special issue released in 1995, 10 years after the TV block began. I'm almost interested in tracking this one down only because I have no clue how you would do an original issue for a block that was just recycled content to begin with. Speaking of anniversaries, the biggest event in Nick Mag's history was its own 10th birthday celebration in 2003, which came with a half hour TV special as a part of the network's old You Pick Live programming block. You make your country proud, Nick Magazine. Happy birthday to you. The behind the scenes content and ways it brought some classic features to TV was pretty neat, but most of this is just lame, unrelated comedy skits and a musical appearance by Weird Al Yankovic. It's just another step in his conquest to appear in every form of children's media, but when Weird Al sang Couch Potato, his riff on Lose Yourself by Eminem, the lyrics were left mostly untouched from his original recording. So this ended up being broadcast on a children's network. Network execs with naked ambitions. Next week on Fox, watch Lions eat Christians. For those who wanted more content based around the network itself, there was Nickelodeon Magazine Presents. These were specials that were published bi-monthly, filled to the brim with comics, both old and new. But I can't really judge their quality myself when copies nowadays are somewhat hard to come by. Whenever I read the Inside Nick section of each main issue, I always wanted more. It's great to go behind the scenes of forgotten shows like Mr. Meaty and Cap Mikey, but I would have loved to see the interviews extended for a few more pages. Certain classics like Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide had barely no coverage within the features themselves, and it left the ads to pick up the slack. Part of my love for this magazine has always been the advertising. I have a soft spot for early 2000s marketing and all the strange ways that it combined live action with cartoonish elements. Much of what the magazine pushed were products of their time, and that makes reading these old issues very entertaining all these years later. Where else can you open up a magazine and see Jerry Seinfeld be spread out on the opening pages, legendary shows like The Spectacular Spider-Man and Johnny Test being advertised side by side, gaming franchises like Chibi Robo, Sly Cooper, and Paper Mario back in their prime, actor Chad Michael Murray having a face that looks like this, and apparently the piggiest comedy of 2008. Back in the day, Cartoon Network snuck ads for their channel onto Nickelodeon's airwaves, but when they finally found their way into their rival's publication, all they had to advertise was CN Real, their live action block that even someone as awesome as Andrew WK couldn't save. Now the question I had upon opening each Nick Mag was how it was going to shove Spongebob into my face. He absorbed more and more of the magazine over time. The comic book editor even admitted that issues sold better whenever that sea critter was slapped on the cover, and there was always some new Spongebob product being advertised. At some points, what they were advertising was pretty similar to the fake products from that one scene in Mel Brooks' Spaceballs. Spaceballs, the flamethrower! <laughs> that kids love this one. Sadly, not even Nickelodeon's poster child could prevent the decline of print media. The issue length began to fluctuate, advertisers pulled out, and more and more of the magazine made the jump to a now defunct website. The final Nickelodeon magazine was published in December of 2009, ending just as the decade of the 2000s came to a close. Only small parts of the publication have been preserved through a few comic compilations, but Nickelodeon magazine itself has lived on through Nickelodeon Magazine, the short-lived 2015 reboot of the same name. I saw these in comic shops, but never bothered to flip through any of them, because half the covers featured Sanjay and Craig, which was certainly a show I did not care for when it was on. Fire! What? Police! That's kind of a joke, I think. What I did read was SpongeBob Comics, a grab bag of different stories from different writers and artists, a majority of which migrated from Nick Mag. I will certainly talk about it someday, but it was like an all SpongeBob issue of the comic book, although it was lacking the strange variety and charm of what came before it. I think what separated this magazine from others of its kind is that it truly knew its audience, but wasn't afraid to push them towards something new. It took all the traditional elements of a generic children's magazine and put very original twists on them. Twists that hold my interest even today. I recommend you seek it out for yourself if this video got you interested, because for me, even reading it secondhand was a unique experience I probably wouldn't have gotten with most other publications. In the older issues I got, there were scribbles all over the puzzles and fill-ins, some with edgy humor that only an 11 year old could truly love, and also an Uno card stuck within a page. But the newer stuff was nearly untouched. Through this decade old magazine, I sort of watched this kid grow up. Who knows where they are today or if they remember this piece of their childhood. 
but they helped me reconnect with mine. Oh, and I guess to an extent, Josh did too. Thanks for all the memories, Nickelodeon Magazine. Thanks for all the memories. <laughs>